Real world assets are when you tokenize something that actually exists. So I consider stable coins the tokenization of cash, of, of currency. So I do consider stable coins as real world assets. The rest of real world assets beyond stable coins is basically the universe of everything that can be represented on a blockchain. That means all real estate, all commodities like gold, oil, copper, everything else, all equities, and eventually all derivatives. The total value of all of that is hundreds of trillions of dollars. Between 400 trillion to 800 trillion, depending on your methodology for calculating. The entire cryptocurrency industry currently fluctuates between two to two and a half trillion. So even if a minuscule percentage of these hundreds of trillions was turned into a real world asset, the real world asset total value would surpass cryptocurrencies massively. Welcome to the Edge Podcast. I'm DeFi Dad here with Nomadic from 4RC. Today's show spotlights Chainlink and its trajectory to tokenize trillions of value in DeFi. In this episode, we speak with Sergey Nazarov about the innovations and grander mission driving the community at Chainlink to become a platform for data, compute, and cross-chain services. But before we do, just a quick word from our sponsors who make the Edge podcast possible. Power up your portfolio by borrowing, lending, and multiplying your favorite assets. Made safe and easy by the industry-leading automation tools at Summer.Fi. Summer.Fi offers a curated DeFi experience to access the highest quality protocols and strategies. Discover new earned strategies for your portfolio in a user-friendly app designed to filter based on the tokens you hold, the networks you transact on, the protocols you trust, and the highest available yields. Learn more today at summer.fi, the best place to borrow and earn in DeFi. Tired of hopping between tabs, searching for new tokens before the hype catches on? Try Matcha.xyz, the DEX aggregator from 0x. Matcha connects hundreds of DEXs so you can trade millions of tokens and find fresh new drops. Matcha works out the best route to save you money on every trade. Swaps are free and Matcha has everything you need to trade on-chain. Gasless swaps, limit orders, and cross-chain, all in one place. Search trade done at matcha.xyz. Introducing Flat Money, the first decentralized delta neutral flat coin built on base with sustainable yield that's completely untethered from legacy finance. Because DeFi needs an uncensorable based unit of currency. You can mint unit with RETH, which is held in the protocol's shared liquidity pool, where it's borrowed by leveraged traders. As a leveraged trader, you can deposit your margin collateral and go long on RE. If you're trading in the perpetual futures market, you'll pay unit holders to open leverage positions. If you're holding unit, you'll earn yield from liquidations, borrow rate, and trading fees. Preserve your purchasing power and offset your exposure to crypto market volatility. Learn more at flat.money. Catch the tide of the mainnet launch of Puffer Finance. Whether you're an Ethereum staker or an aspiring node operator, Puffer delivers the decentralization revolution with its cutting edge technology. Start with just two ETH to unlock the potential of native liquid restaking and maximize your earnings. Join the movement now and anchor your stake at Puffer.Fi. All right, let's introduce Sergey Nazarov, the co-founder of Chainlink. Sergey, welcome to the Edge Podcast. How are you doing? Doing well. Thank you for having me. You know, as a user of DeFi since like 2019, I've gotten to benefit firsthand from Chainlink. Um, I do recall uh, my first real instance with it was back when Chainlink was powering synthetics perps. And that was where I, I first truly understood like the importance of Chainlink as a protocol. So that said, we know lots of friends who need a catch up on Chainlink. And so hopefully this will serve as a, again, a very comprehensive overview. So that said, Sergey, do you mind kicking off with just a little bit more about your background? I'm not sure if you get asked this question anymore. You, you've been in, in the space for so long, but maybe just share a bit about like what got you into crypto and, and, and let's talk a little bit about the founding of uh, Chainlink. 
Sure. So I got into the blockchain industry in 2010, back when it was the Bitcoin industry, because Bitcoin was the only chain that existed. I began uh, basically by mining, because that's one of the things, one of the few things you you could do. Then when smart contracts uh, started appearing in the 12, you know, 13, 14 time period, uh, before Ethereum, I worked with, you know, many other great people on some of the early smart contracts that existed even before Ethereum. And my conception of smart contracts always included that they were connected to external systems. Ethereum did a really great job in creating a reusable programming language for on-chain state, but the problem of connecting that on-chain state to other contracts and other chains or connecting it to data or identity or payments or really anything outside of a blockchain wasn't solved. And the the thing that we were working on was basically, without even fully knowing it, was an Oracle system. And then the way that evolved was into a decentralized version of an Oracle, which is what an Oracle network is. And so then the Chainlink kind of community and me and a few other folks went on to invent the decentralized Oracle network, which is a new way to generate consensus on non-blockchain things. So a simple way to understand oracles is that blockchains get their value from generating consensus, essentially agreement between independent servers about what is in a block. But the things that those independent servers can agree on is a limited universe of things. Whereas an oracle network comes to consensus about things outside of a blockchain. So blockchains come to consensus really about three things. There was a signature, there was a state change, or kind of uh, how the tokens have been have been moving. That's basically what um, what blockchains come to consensus on, which is why tokenization is such, such a common use case with them. But they are not able to interface with anything else. And so the the origin of all this was basically us working on smart contracts for many years uh, before Ethereum existed, before smart contracts were a tokenization method, and um, realizing that the external world would need to interact with blockchains and smart contracts in an equally reliable way to what the smart contracts themselves do. Because if you connect the smart contract to another system, the smart contracts have this kind of irreversible tamper-proof thing, property, where you're basically ceding control of whatever's in the smart contract to this other thing. Like if you can connect it to a central server for price, or if you connect it to a central server for automation or any number of other things. And this is essentially the risk and the problem that me and a few other people and I think the Chainlink community sees as the big problem for allowing smart contracts to go to the next level. And so ended up uh, launching the first decentralized Oracle network, I think now five years ago on production. Uh, Yeah, I think that's that's right. Over five years ago on production. And since then, the Chainlink uh, kind of network has grown into over a thousand individual Oracle networks. So Oracle networks do not have a chain. They don't make blocks. They don't uh, create transactions about tokens going between addresses in the same chain. They provide a kind of service or a set of services around different types of data and connectivity across chains. And Chainlink is the system that invented the centralized Oracle networks, and it's the system that has the most security and the longest running track record. And that security and track record is quite important because generally in very security sensitive markets, the more value a system secures, the less willing it is to compromise or save money on security. Smaller systems that don't secure a lot of value can make their own home big thing or they can try some stuff. But eventually, I feel that in very security sensitive industries, and this is proven out in various other security sensitive industries, people gravitate towards the most uh, secure way of doing things. And so that's what Chainlink has really become. It's become the most secure way for blockchains to interact with anything outside of them and any interaction between those chains. So the cross-chain interoperability problem is 
basically a restated version of the Oracle problem, which is what, what Chainlink solves. And so Chainlink is now a standard for how all of those interactions happen into, out of, and between chains, but it's also uh, the most secure infrastructure for doing that. So it's both a protocol and a standard, and it's an infrastructure, a global infrastructure for actually executing that protocol. I think what would be really interesting for us to discuss is you, you gave like a really good, almost like mini history of Chainlink there, and we're somewhat caught up. And I think for people that have maybe thought of Chainlink as supplying price data, um, there's there's so much more that's been evolving over the past many years. And I kind of want to dive into that because Chainlink, like you said, is, is becoming basically a platform for data, compute, and cross-chain services. Maybe just kind of go into how that evolution has happened again. Sure. So Chainlink is known for solving the Oracle problem, but the Oracle problem is, is actually more expansive than people think. G- generally, platforms expand in, in a very similar pattern you have a kind of new way to do computation, and then you have a first killer use case of that computation. So for example, with Amazon Web Services, they pioneered cloud computation as a really successful thing. But the first thing that cloud computation was used for by them was S3, which is basically just a data storage service. But AWS didn't stop at S3. It continued to generate hundreds of other services in the cloud computing model. Likewise, the operating system, the Windows operating system, started with the killer use case of spreadsheets, but the computing model of an operating system for consumers had many other applications and, and software and stuff. Same thing with Salesforce. They started with the CRM, and now they provide many other pieces of software in the SaaS kind of delivery model, computing model. So Oracle networks are really a computing environment that creates trust-minimized computations. So those are computations that you can trust more than centralized computations. And it, it, it makes logical sense that the first early adopter user base would be a very trust-sensitive user base. That is the DeFi community, that is the blockchain community, that is the cryptocurrency community. But And, and it, it also makes sense for platforms to begin against a very specific uh, application of their computing kind of um, revolutionary computing sync. But just like all those other platforms expanded their ability to do computation in new ways, the Oracle network method of doing computation has now successfully also expanded beyond just price data. So there would have been a point in time when you would talk to people about AWS and they would have said, oh yeah, it's that storage thing because the only thing it did with S was S3. But now you talk to people about AWS and it's like, yeah, AWS, it does everything, right? That's how expansive Oracle networks really are with with the caveat that they do not generate blocks. So they do not make a chain. They do not generate blocks with transactions inside the blocks. They inject and they act on events and blocks. So anything that a blockchain would ever need, a piece of identity data, a piece of weather data, a connection to another blockchain, a connection to a payment system like Swift, a connection to an AI model to receive an instruction or ask a question of an AI model. All of these things are critical components of a more advanced application, such as a real-world asset token. So one of the ways that Chainlink has expanded is it provided the price data for DeFi, that allowed DeFi to grow from a sub-100 million total value industry to an over 200 billion total value industry, with Chainlink powering the majority of it along the way and still powering the majority of it because of that kind of um, advantage, the kind of security advantage that Chainlink has and people not wanting to put their user funds at risk. But as the DeFi ecosystem became more complex and wanted to do more advanced things, and as more advanced smart contracts came around, the Oracle network computing environment started doing more because the smart contract market was kind of pulling more out of the Chainlink community and the Chainlink system. For example, the random number generation service is very widely used, the automation service, but if, if, if you basically think about what it takes to build an application, you come up with three fundamental things. 
well, actually four. You come up with the data structure, which is the blockchain. Then you come up with computation, which is now partly split between the blockchain and Oracle networks, because part of the computation is on the blockchain, part of the computation is in an Oracle network. Then you have the data that flows into the computation. There are some computations that don't need data, but they're usually very limited. All more advanced computations, all financial products that you would interact with in the traditional financial system, for example, need multiple data connections for them to work. And then you also have a kind of middleware connectivity problem around how to connect an application to a whole bunch of other systems and services, such as uh, other clouds, other databases, other things. So this is the universe of things that the Chainlink community has taken on, is how to solve these additional problems beyond creating the state machine on a blockchain whose state is consistently updated every time when you block or, you know, some state is updated, some isn't. But basically, every time a new block is generated, you have an update to the state of certain contracts. The, the blockchain is really a very good transactional mechanism and a good data structure and a good place to put trust-minimized, light computations that are guaranteeing certain financial outcomes and sharing key points of reference and data about that transaction. Oracle Networks already are handling all the other compute load, interacting with AI, interacting with other data, doing computations around that data that's too costly or complicated for a blockchain to do, connecting multiple contracts on multiple chains into what you could call a multi-chain kind of contract, a contract that works across multiple chains, the same way that a web uh, system, a web app, is working across multiple clouds. So... I think the world that we're we're going to be arriving at is is not a world where a smart contract as a whole operates on a single chain, just like a web application doesn't usually run just on a single cloud. If you look at Netflix or Uber, or these web applications we're quite used to, if you look under the hood, you would actually see thousands sometimes, literally thousands of separate services interacting with each other on multiple clouds. And that, that's going to be the architecture of the more advanced next generation smart contracts that are now emerging from DeFi and from TradFi, sometimes taking the form of real world assets and tokenized funds. And it's that architecture of multiple services interacting that Chainlink is kind of driving forward. Some of those services will be other smart contracts, for example, like a payment calculation contract to decide how much of a dividend something should give out. But then there will be off-chain services, and all the off-chain services will be in the form of an Oracle network because, once again, you don't want to cede control over the contract to any one system. And the Oracle networks create that reliability between the smart contract and all the other systems. So it's, it's a fundamentally different set of problems, but they're very important and very valuable if you're going to go beyond the most basic smart contract use cases. Good example is DeFi. DeFi wouldn't exist without Oracle Networks. Most RWAs need data. All of the TradFi contracts, like tokenized funds, need data. All of these more advanced things that aren't just really, really basic stuff, like I made a token, it's not about anything other than what it's about, like it's just a cryptocurrency with no connection to anything else. That is the thing that blockchains can do on their own and, and some state changes. If you want to do anything beyond that, DeFi, real-world assets, insurance, global trade, ad networks, any anything else, you need Oracle Networks. And so Chainlink has now expanded as a platform to cover all those other types of services. And um, really, it's a framework for making those services in a decentralized, highly reliable, immune to manipulation, most secure possible way. That's that's what it that's what it's really about now. Yeah, Chainlink has always been a proof point for the maturation of DeFi. It's also been this insane catalyst for all these new use cases. And honestly, as you're talking, Sergey, I'm just like, you know, it's allowing me to just reflect over the last few years when I think about like 
2020, like what simple use cases we had and like where we've gotten to. And, and yeah, just it's, it's like wild, the progress that we've made over the years. And and again, I think it's a testament to like what Chainlink has, has brought to the space. Um, going with just the, the evolution of, of this platform, uh, one of the major product releases that I think signaled that evolution in the past year is known as CCIP. Can you explain its functionality and like how does it differ from other cross-chain solutions? Sure. So CCIP is meant to play a similar role to TCPIP. TCPIP is the technology that unified uh, all kinds of different technologies into what we know as the internet. So for example, when you and me want to transact over the internet, you can be on a, one database technology and I can be on another database technology and I don't need to coordinate with you, right? Because I don't need to contact you and figure out what database you're on and you don't need to know what database I'm on. Our databases can kind of send information to each other over a protocol, TCP IP. So this is what allowed the internet to emerge out of, out of a world of multiple fragmented kind of technologies and kept it together such that you can go onto the internet using a multitude of different technologies, but you're on a single internet that's interconnected over TCP IP. This is what our industry needs in order for it to reach the next stage. And this needs to be highly secure, and it needs to be something that provides certain transactional guarantees that current cross-chain systems don't provide. So CCIP, the Cross-Chain Interoperability Protocol, is a kind of global community and and really standard for how blockchains interact with each other. And the the way this looks when it's working at scale is that you're launching a smart contract in multiple separate parts on multiple chains. Just like when you're launching a web application, you might use one service from AWS and you might use another service from Google Cloud but you can combine those two services on those two different clouds into what you consider your application. And you can do that because those clouds can seamlessly communicate with each other and allow those services to work with each other. So this is really uh, what, what the project of CCIP is and to unify also the DeFi community and the TradFi community. So you 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 shouldn't be having a private chain internet and a public chain internet and a, some other chain and a central bank internet. You should just have a single, what we call internet of contracts. So so that's really the project. And the internet of contracts is the central banks, the commercial banks, the insurance companies, the DeFi startups, fintechs, everybody on a single standard for communicating value and data to each other. And it's very important that it's both value and data because the way that smart contracts work is not by simply managing and conveying value. The way more advanced smart, contract wor- smart contracts like DeFi or real world assets work is by conveying both value and the data. So in, in the world that we're in now, data and value have become tightly coupled. For example, you really can't make a tokenized fund without providing something like the net asset value of that fund as a real-world asset. Fund tokenization is this very big trend in real-world assets. Basically, if you make a tokenized fund without the NAV data, you know that has its own serious problems. You can't make DeFi without data, likewise. So the, the world that we're in now is that applications need to work across chains, both in their transmission of value and transmission of data. So here is how CCIP solves these problems in a few unique ways. Because Chainlink is the only ecosystem and protocol that is involved in both generating on-chain data connections and cross-chain connections, it is the only system that I feel that has actually thought through how data and value move across chains together. So when you make a real-world asset token... Right now, you're doing two things. You'll eventually be doing three things. The first thing that you're doing is you're making an ownership right. Then you are attaching to that ownership right a piece of data, like what is going on with the underlying asset represented by the, that ownership right. If you transfer the ownership right, if you transfer the token from blockchain A to blockchain B, 
but you don't have a way to maintain the connection of the data to the token as it goes to blockchain B, you've basically lost the value of the system you've created. What, what we call smart contracts that are able to operate across chains with a consistent connection to data is a unified golden record. So this means you can generate this smart contract with data connections on chain A. You can sell it to someone on chain B. They can resell it to someone on chain C. And as this token is moving across all these chains, the connection back to the data is maintained, which means that the, the fundamental value of the token and what it can prove to you about the underlying asset is maintained. And this is one of the big new things that's happening. The second big category of activity uh, that's important from the point of view of CCIP is all of the security features and the ability to resist various attacks because of the risk management network and various other key kind of properties of, of how the security is generated. I feel that this is done within the Chainlink world through, through through two fundamental principles. The first principle is the centralization. So if you look at many other bridges, what you'll find is they are basically two of two multi-sigs. A two of two multi-sig is not a good idea for securing large amounts of value. Some of the people that people, some of the biggest bridges out there actually function in this way. And whenever I see them, I think back on um, multi-chain. Multi-chain was a highly uh, widely used, widely integrated system with, I think, over 120 chain integrations. And it eventually got shut down and stopped based on a single set of keys and a single laptop being compromised. So this is the type of situation that I still feel people don't fully understand. There's a lot of noise about how secure and decentralized everything is, but many of the bridges out there have basically just achieved the absolute bare minimum of not just having a single signer, having a two of two multi-sig. So this means you only need to compromise two keys to gain access to all the value in that bridge. These are very, very serious concerns um, that I think people still don't fully value and appreciate. That's that's the first uh, first big difference. In the Chainlink ecosystem, each individual lane has large amounts of nodes, verifiably independent nodes, and they're following a protocol to generate secure signing outcomes. Actually, every CCIP lane is three Oracle networks, all interoperating with each other for that one lane. A committing decentralized Oracle network, an executing decentralized Oracle network, and a risk management decentralized Oracle network. So the amount of decentralization that Chainlink and the, the bridging system has, I think, is basically unparalleled. The second uh, really big thing is what we call a principle design approach. So the way that many people design Oracle systems, when they don't have anybody from the academic or the research community working on their team, and at Chainlink Labs, we have, I think, over 20 researchers working with us. And we have a very large relationship with the whole research, security research and academic community. And the, 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 fundamental, the fundamental design process for making infrastructure is different than the fundamental design process for making web applications or applications that depend on infrastructure to work. So the way that you make applications that depend on infrastructure to work at least in the Web 2 world. I don't, I don't even recommend this in the Web 3 world. But it's this move fast and break things model where it's like, if we find a problem, we'll iterate on it and we'll plug the hole then. That doesn't require that much upfront design because the assumption is that if you have a problem, you'll simply do a redesign on the fly. Now, that is possible in the Web world, which is made where many of the developers in our industry effectively come from. Because you have infrastructure in the web world that allows you to quickly adapt and do other new things. That model of incrementally looking to fail in order to find your problems is not really the right way to design infrastructure. The right way to design infrastructure is to take a principled design approach where you define key fundamental principles about the security guarantees of the system and what they need to meet and what they need to achieve. And 
if that isn't achieved, then you don't do that design. Then you keep kind of grinding on the design until you get it to, to meet that requirement. This principle design approach is one of the reasons that Chainlink has resisted things like flash loan attacks. And one of the reasons it powers the, the majority of DeFi. Because the way other people build oracles, because they don't have a single person on their team that understands how to do a principle design approach. They don't even know what that is because it's, it's not something that, you know, the average web developer is taught or engages in. Is by basically building something that's not immune to various attacks, is then attacked, and then they try to fix it. But that's not really, once again, how you build a secure, reliable infrastructure. So systems like Swift, systems like AWS, when you look at their organizational priorities and their community priorities, security is at the top. So similarly in the Chainlink community, security and reliability is at the top because you need a secure, reliable infrastructure in order for all this to work at all, in order for DeFi to work at all, in order for RWEs to work at all. And so I think you just see that in many different ways in how CCIP is built. The risk management network is a good example where the way that other cross-chain protocols address risks is by changing their core protocol. The way the risk management network approaches risk is by defining the risks in very specific ways and allowing you to modify those definitions pretty quickly in order to adapt to new risks. So basically, the CCIP system is something that's designed in a principal way by the top research academics, and it's built off the back of the Oracle network model that is truly decentralized. Before we get back to the show, just a quick thanks to our sponsor at Mantle Network, the layer two that pioneered the fifth largest LST with 1.6 billion TVL called Math. Since July 1st, Mantle is running a 100-day airdrop campaign called Metamorphosis to distribute a new governance token for the Mantle liquid staking protocol called Cook. The community can earn points for Cook called Powder by holding meth in Metamorphosis and simultaneously enjoying other yield and reward opportunities in the Mantle ecosystem. Users can also earn powder by staking MNT in the Mantle Rewards Station. For more details, go to the Mantle blog at mantle.xyz slash blog and follow the 0x Mantle handle on Twitter for more updates. Sergey, I feel like we could have done a whole pod just on CCIP, uh, but I'm, I'm glad you wove in that tokenization example near the beginning because that's kind of where I want to go next. Uh, it's a term that's been thrown around a lot in our industry by notable people such as Larry Fink now from BlackRock. And then the term RWA uh, is scattered around all the time as well. But I sometimes feel like people can't even connect to what those words mean, like in relationship to like, how is this happening on the blockchain? And I would love if you have any kind of like real world asset use cases that you've seen recently, or if you can kind of break this down, like how it's actually happening for, for people, I think that would be great. Sure. So if you count stable coins, in addition to all the other RWAs, RWAs have flipped DeFi for the largest amount of value outside of cryptocurrencies, right? So cryptocurrencies to me are very blockchain specific tokens or tokens that only have value because a market has agreed on a price. Real world assets are when you tokenize something that actually exists. So I consider stable coins the tokenization of cash, of, of currency. So I do consider stable coins as real world assets. The rest of real world assets beyond stable coins is basically the universe of everything that can be represented on a blockchain. That means all real estate, all commodities like gold, oil, copper, everything else, all equities, and eventually all derivatives. The total value of all of that is hundreds of trillions of dollars. Between 400 trillion to 800 trillion, depending on your methodology for calculating. The entire cryptocurrency industry currently fluctuates between two to two and a half trillion. So even if a minuscule percentage of these hundreds of trillions 
was turned into a real-world asset. The real-world asset total value would surpass cryptocurrencies massively. Personally, I think that our industry will go on to be defined more by real-world assets than cryptocurrencies. I think you, you will reach a point in the next few years where the amount of value in real-world assets is more than the amount of value in cryptocurrencies. And then our industry will become not just about cryptocurrencies, but about real-world assets. And then eventually real-world assets will surpass cryptocurrencies. And this is what Larry Fink is talking about. He's saying that these are the technologies. Like, think about how much just BlackRock manages. Just BlackRock, just one fund manager, $10 trillion. That's four times the size of the entire cryptocurrency industry in just a single manager. Admittedly, it's a very large manager, I think maybe the largest, but there is way more than that out there. So we, for example, have gone live on production with Fidelity, putting critical pieces of data like NAV data on chain. And this is uh, really what I think you can expect to see from this industry more. You can see people like Fidelity, BlackRock, big banks, big exchanges, everybody eventually pumping all of their current value, all of their current assets, all of their current commodities into a blockchain of some kind. Frankly, whether it's a public chain or a private chain is a very small point that I don't think matters very much because eventually, once again, if we get cross-chain to work correctly, it won't matter. If you're on a private chain or if you're on a public chain, just like it doesn't matter today what database I'm on or what database I, you're on, our database technologies don't have to you know, be similar in any way. And I don't think our blockchain technologies will have to be similar in any way or private or public or on these nodes or on those nodes. What will what'll end up mattering is what is the value of doing a transaction? What is the value of the liquidity in a bank chain that has millions of customers on their chain, represented by addresses on that chain, what is the value of those millions of customers being able to purchase my real-world asset on my chain? And I think that is basically the value of the entire global financial system, the entire insurance industry, and also, most likely, probably the entire supply chain, trade finance, global supply chain industry at a minimum. So I think what what, what it'll also do actually is bring the mainstream in because this is something that is not about meme coins. I don't have anything against meme coins, but it is not something that's going to take our industry to the next level. It's going to be this stuff, real world assets, tokenized real estate, tokenized equity, tokenized commodities, tokenized funds that eventually bring all of this technology mainstream, which by the way, is the fundamental goal of our industry. So my opinion is that our industry's goal is not to remain a cottage industry where people generate new tokens to send them to each other about various, you know, esoteric concepts. This is, this is a great starting point and many industries start this way. The internet started in a similar way. It's, it's great. Lots of great early adopter stuff. I'm a huge fan of it. Really kind of almost missed the smaller sized community in that sense. So it's very exciting. But our goal as an industry is to power how everything works. That is the goal of, of a technology, to achieve growth and power how everything works. And this is the path to that, basically. And then the role that Chainlink plays in all this is allowing those real-world assets to come into existence, allowing tokenized funds to come into existence, allowing those real-world assets and tokenized funds to interact with each other across chains, allowing stable coins to be used as payment, allowing central bank digital currencies to be used as payment in this growing ecosystem. So I think that real-world assets uh, is already the biggest trend in DeFi. Uh, sorry, the biggest trend in the blockchain world that has surpassed DeFi. And, and that's kind of the thing I think people don't, for some reason, fully grasp yet. But once that becomes apparent, I think our industry will become more and more and more about this. 
And once the total real world asset value surpasses the cryptocurrency value, then this, by certain definitions, will be what our industry is about. I want to clip that soundbite and I'm going to put that in my alarm clock and just listen to that every day there. That, that is, that's the way I want to wake up every day. Uh, Sergey, given the, like, let's say 400 trillion to 800 trillion dollars of value that we are talking about globally that could be tokenized, brought on chain, what barriers do you see that, uh, you know, prevent us from getting more of these RWAs on chain? Because real world assets are often regulated. There's a lot of legal barriers. Those barriers are being successfully surpassed because regulation in certain parts of the world, like Asia and part of Europe, have achieved significant clarity. For example, on stable coins, there has been significantly more clarity in, I would say, even recent months, not even recent years. So I think we're kind of at a key inflection point where the amount of clarity on how a real world asset can be legally owned through a blockchain, which is very important because if you're going to legally have a relationship with something, you you want that to be formed against you know the the existing legal system. So that is 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 a is a barrier, especially for the TradFi community. For the the DeFi community, that's partly the barrier. Another part of the barrier is getting access to the assets and properly structuring everything around them. That is also getting getting solved. But but the real challenge here is that if before you could have just made a token and said, you know, this token is about Pencoin. Pencoin is great. We buy and sell it. You didn't need to connect it to anything. You didn't need to make it about anything. Stable coins, as you know, have all kinds of problems proving their reserves, assuring people that the cash is actually there. That's an example of the complexity that comes with making given the most basic real world asset work, right? It's that the real world asset doesn't work without the relevant assurances. And so the way that Chainlink fits into this is creating proof of reserves and operating that uh, as a part of the protocol and through the community as the leading source of proof of reserves for the most stable coins, gold coins, and others to prove that the stable coin or gold coin is actually backed by real cash or gold. So I think part of it is is the complexity of structuring these things and proving to people sufficiently that the real world asset is in a certain state. And part of it is the legal guarantees that people need. The, the other thing that I think will continue to hold up our industry's adoption on the public chain side is the user experience of private keys, which still needs to be solved. But in the TradFi world, I don't think that'll be as big a problem because people there will not have access to their private keys, which is like a um, you know blasphemous thing to say if you're a blockchain decentralized m- maximalist person, which personally I am. So I understand why that's kind of upsetting because the whole point is that people gain control over over their assets and over their contracts. But I think that a large percentage of people will come in through traditional financial institutions and their value will flow on chain through those institutions. And eventually they will demand of those institutions that they have private key control many years down the line, and then they will get that private key control. That also partly depends on making a better user experience around private keys. So I think generally private key user experience needs to improve. The structuring of these real world assets and connecting them to data and all that stuff is getting simplified by us. And then the legal frameworks around guaranteeing your relationship with the actual underlying asset is actually important uh, in in this category of of what blockchains do. But that's also rapidly improving. So I I think we're kind of at a a really unique place where the real world asset industry is going to really grow this year. And my expectation, if the global macro economy continues to grow for some completely unknowable reason considering the amount of money that was printed but whatever if 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 kind of that music keeps playing then i think there will be a real world asset boom next year and the year after based on all all the things i'm seeing in terms of the amount of people that are that are generating those i think we're in the i think we're in like the very very early days of real world assets 
uh, as evidenced by that you feel that even so, so, some people don't fully understand it yet. So I think it's a very early days type of type of place. And, and, and even in early day levels, it has eclipsed DeFi by the total value. So that really says something. Sergey, I think this is like a good transition into maybe just talking about how Chainlink infrastructure is supporting this growing uh, interaction between DeFi and TradFi. Sure, sure. So I've been working with the TradFi uh, industry and some of the biggest infrastructures in that industry for over seven years now. So Swift, the first uh, public thing that we did with them was back, I think, in 2016. And we were working with them even before 2016. And then we did a second public uh, pilot with them recently. And also now we've done public pilots with DTCC, which is the Clearing and Settlement System of the United States, which settles $2.4 quadrillion annually. So it's the largest volume of, of anything out there because the U.S. securities industry is the largest securities industry in the world. So in working with these different infrastructures and the commercial banks and the exchanges in the traditional world, many of these places being well over 100 years old, what you basically realize is is two things. Um, the first thing is there's a long history of decisions that were made about how everything works from two points of view. One way is a legal point of view, and the other way is the technical point of view, how to make it work. And then the second thing that you realize is that all of these decisions eventually had very large amounts of value put onto them. And when you put these two things together, what you basically also realize is that they will never replace their old system. They're not going to replace it. The way that all of these places work is they are what people in in the industry call an onion. So it's it's basically layer upon layer of technology. This is why you hear about cobalt being run in banks and how old everything is. It's because if something is successfully running billions of dollars in value or transactions and it's compliant and it's working, the incentive to remove it is extremely low and the risk of removing it is extremely high. So based on this kind of simple fact of life, the Chainlink community's approach to this part of the blockchain user base, the TradFi user base, which by total value is the largest user base, not by total users. So by total accounts and total users, the retail user base will definitely be the largest. That's literally billions of people. But by total value, the institutional financial world will be the largest by total value with many fewer accounts, basically. If these people aren't going to replace anything and they're going to continue to hold on to that value, the logical approach is to be compatible. So our approach is not to throw out their system. Our approach in the Chainlink community is to be compatible. This is... um, most clearly demonstrated through our work with Swift, which for over 50 years has been successfully processing transactions. Swift has been processing transactions as basically three things. Swift is the most widely used private key signing system for high value things. So they have given every bank, over 11,000 banks, private keys, little things you can side value with. Great news, those private keys can be used to sign messages about blockchain things if that is properly architected through what we do with that. The second thing Swift is, is a set of standards for how to define transactions. And the third thing is a message routing system to actually do the transactions. Now, these things fundamentally can continue to serve their purpose and simply interface with blockchains through CCIP. So our goal is not to replace existing systems. It is to get as much value as possible onto blockchains. If that value is controlled from an existing system, but is essentially migrated into a blockchain, that's great. If it, it doesn't matter to me if you control a stable coin through a Swift private key or through your ledger. What matters is that more value goes into stable coins, right? 
And considering the amount of value that already sits on these private keys in places like Swift, DTCC, all these other places, big, big infrastructure places, the first key question is, how does that value successfully migrate on chain? And the answer is by making the systems that currently control that value compatible with chains, which is what CCIP does, which is what the blockchain abstraction layer does. That has been the approach we've been taking for approaching a decade. Now, it's really complicated to do, and it takes time because, and I didn't really understand why it would take so long, but now I do. It's because when you process quadrillions of dollars in value, the more value you process, the more cautious you have to be about making a mistake. But now the blockchain industry has reached such an important position, so much so that it's a political issue, so much so that the top users of these infrastructures are blockchain users and starting to do transactions on them, that it's pretty much critical that you as an infrastructure interface with blockchains. So the market demand has pushed things sufficiently strongly in this direction. And our approach is to enable all of this to interact. The way this looks for commercial banks and for exchanges is their current systems continue to operate as they've been operating, but they get a new transaction type called a blockchain transaction. And from their existing backends, they execute this transaction. And CCIP and the blockchain abstraction layer are the thing that actually executed on chain and actually inform them about what happened. So the blockchain abstraction layer within CCIP is basically an interface between their systems and all blockchains and all smart contracts such that they don't need to actually know or choose chains. They just need to say, I want to do this transaction in that chain. They don't actually need to understand the chain or deal with it because they have what's known as an abstraction between them and that technology. Frankly, much of computer science is just abstraction layer upon abstraction layer upon abstraction layer to make it easier and easier for developers and users to interact with technology. And that's what CCIP and the blockchain abstraction layer is. It um, is an abstraction. Like JavaScript is an example of an abstraction that simplifies web development. CCIP and the blockchain abstraction layer are an abstraction that simplify the interaction with chains from existing systems. Sergey, just listening to you talk through this TradFi onion that you uh, phrased it as, it it just seems to me like you've been doing this for like a decade, working on this integration. Um, what like what kind of a moat or like competitive advantage would you say you have now in this space? Like to me, like doing an incredible, incredibly hard thing is typically a moat in and of itself. But yeah, just kind of curious how you think of it at this point, uh, looking at how far you guys have come. What what I would say is is when I look at how other people are building the security of their systems of their infrastructures that that try to do what Chainlink does, I see a lot of serious problems that real value, trillions of dollars in value, quadrillions of dollars in value will not find acceptable. And I think that the Chainlink community and the protocol that, that I'm spending basically all of my waking time on, along with many other smart people, spending all of their waking conscious time on um, is built to adhere to not only what the DeFi community needs, but also what the TradFi community needs. And weaving these two communities together by providing them with the reliability and security and compliance that they need to interact with each other, I think is really going to be what creates this internet of contracts. Um I, I think the really big advantages for Chainlink are its security, are its ability to provide connections to places and things that other places don't, and uh, frankly, that it interacts with everything that a smart contract needs, not just another chain, not just a piece of data, not just an AI model, not just an automation system, but all of these things. Because frankly, all of these things, 
will need to work together in order for a smart contract and the more valuable blockchain transactions to be possible. So between the security, the systems that uh, will be connected into the Chainlink network, and the ability for it to deal with data, cross-chain, AI, automation, all of these problems in one platform, in one set of systems. I think... If you even have two of those, if you have one of those three, you do very well in terms of competitive advantage. If you have two of those three, you do extremely well. If you have all three of those properties in your system, then I think you you probably arrive at a system that can define how transactions and assets work for decades. My my personal goal, my my view is that spending all this time on this is 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 worth it if if we can get three of those three things. So that is something I would be very proud of, and I, I'm I'm willing to spend a lot of my time on together with a lot of other smart people. But um, I I think we'll be in a world where on a single standard, you have all central banks, all commercial banks, all asset managers transacting with each other. You, you can't not have a standard for that because the complexity of people figuring out each transaction, each interaction is just too great. It's just not, not realistic. And the more assets on chain, the more stable coins on chain, the more transactions that are kind of going towards each other, the more necessary a standard like that is. I, th- I think the coolest thing would be if you arrive at a point where CCIP is like TCPIP. It's an afterthought. It's an obvious way for how everything works. And that chain link is really just like a big set of protocols like TCPIP, HTTPS, SSL. Like it's that set of protocols. And eventually, chain link is just kind of like the beginning of that. And eventually, it just becomes the internet of contracts or maybe just rolls into what the internet is. As, as a set of standards that help define what that is. Because maybe people don't want to say internet of contracts. Maybe they just want to say internet. Um, but I think, yeah, it's going to be very hard for anybody to overcome TCP IP and replace it. It would be very hard for somebody to replace something similar to that in the blockchain industry once enough of the world's value and systems are on that. Sergey, as we come to the end of our our time here, I would be remiss not to ask you about how does Chainlink see its role in a world of increasing demand for AI? Like, where do you see that intersection of AI, smart contracts, and Chainlink? Sure. So I I think there's two concrete ways in the near term, and there's one long-term possibility. The the first two concrete near-term ways are providing access to AI for smart contracts. Because once again, Chainlink is the mechanism through which smart contracts interact with everything outside. So if a smart contract wants to use an AI model, it can't just go use it. It has to do it through an Oracle. And the best way to use it is through an Oracle network because that's more secure. So you you basically have to um, do that. You have to have an Oracle network. So whatever value AI has for deciding a trade for controlling a smart contract, for creating a blockchain event, we'll go through Oracle Networks. And Chainlink is the most widely used Oracle Network, so that's pretty obvious direct use case right there. The second use case is coming to consensus about AI results. So let's say you have multiple AI models that are sufficiently different from each other. Part of the problem right now is that many AI models are not that different from each other. They're basically all based on the transformer architecture and a few other things, and they're pretty similar. But let's say you had a world where you had pretty different AI models, and aggregating the result of multiple AI models from multiple competing firms was valuable. Well, guess what Chainlink does really well? It aggregates results from multiple things to come to a single final outcome, a single final input. So that could be done for AI. Uh, that's something that's getting heavily explored and, and actually worked on to certain degrees. 
That's the two near-term opportunities. So Oracle Networks could be the way to interact with AI generally, because it could aggregate the responses and results of multiple AI systems. The third category is if you have a world full of adversarial AIs. So if shit gets really bad and the average high school student can spin up an AI and start causing all kinds of havoc because it becomes easy to make YouTube music videos, but it also becomes easy to hack things because it turns out that AIs are good at both. If you end up in a world like that, that I think the security generated by Oracle Networks and the security that's generated by the genuine, true, real decentralization of Chainlink Oracle Networks will make them an even more valuable form of computation. So right now, they're a valuable form of computation around certain data events, like data aggregation, certain automation events, certain cross-chain events that are connected to value. But let's imagine a world where AIs can pretty easily manipulate many or most centralized systems. Because let's assume that our whole thesis about decentralization creating more security and tamper-proofness is true. Let's assume more decentralized systems are more secure. Well, in a world where security becomes more valuable because adversarial AIs can knock over most things... Security is more valuable. So it's it's very possible that Oracle Networks become a computational environment that's valuable from that point of view. There, there are cases where people use decentralized Oracle Networks with Web 2 systems, not Web 3 systems, when they value the reliability of the input into the Web 2 system at a sufficiently high degree. So it's possible that we end up in a world where there's more and more systems that want a tamper-proof, consensus-based input from an Oracle network because the other places they could get that from are not as trustworthy or as reliable as an Oracle network. That is a pretty scary world, frankly. Um, but I think it's, it's entirely possible because I think that people, the thing that people miss about AI is they're like, yeah, don't worry. It'll be fine. We'll somehow figure it out. We'll control it. So even if AI doesn't become self-aware and you know we're all running for our lives because the Terminators are coming, like even if that doesn't happen, people will be able to do bad things more easily as well as good things more easily. I, I think people don't maybe fully appreciate how much easier it's going to be to hack things when you have unlimited access to really powerful AI agents and what that means for the cybersecurity industry and for data sources and for a whole bunch of stuff. So if Oracle Networks can be made resistant to that adversary, that could end up being pretty valuable, in, in my opinion. Um, but once again, that's all conjecture. I don't know. But I, I, I have a strong feeling after playing with some of these things that there will be really, really cool music videos. And then your music video won't work because the electricity grid went down. Because a high school student figured out how to use an AI to shut down the electricity grid. Like that's a real thing that can happen, which is pretty freaky. But yeah. I'll leave it with you there on this positive note. Yeah, I I think it's very well said. I I to see a future where um security through decentralization is much more valued and I I think to your point we, we could do a whole podcast on this that there's a lot of um, scary things to to consider um you know as AI becomes more prevalent in our lives and Despite all the the positives there, what are some of the negatives? And and I think there's a nice tie in there to um, what can uh, a decentralized blockchain enable in the future? And so, guys, this is a great place for us to wrap up, though. So I want to remind our listeners that they should learn more about Chainlink by going to chain.link. They should follow Chainlink on Twitter, follow Sergey Nazarov on Twitter. All that's in our show notes, so you can easily reference it. 
Sergey, thank you so much for coming on. I, I think that uh, this podcast, this conversation, your words are the cure to some of the the disease of nihilism I see on crypto Twitter and just in in different parts of the crypto space. I personally am still, you know, driven day to day by this, like, why is crypto so important? Why is DeFi so important? Like, what's that future of merging, you know, the the world of the world that is physical with the world that is digital? And, and you know, speaking to what you said about bringing RWAs on chain, so it's just very inspiring to hear you articulate that much much better than I think Nomadic and and I could ever do. So. That said, um, any final word for our listeners? And, and again, just thank you for your time. Yes, my pleasure. I appreciate that sentiment. Uh, I think the cure for nihilism is a deeper understanding. So I, I feel like if that's what we've been able to, to, to help with here in this podcast, that's a great thing. And generally, as, as the whole uh, blockchain industry evolves, I really think that it's so complicated and it deals with such esoteric back-end problems like settlement and all these kind of esoteric things that before anyone jumps to a conclusion about its value or what it is going to be used for or not be used for, I think that a real examination or a deeper understanding of the problem that it's meant to solve is is important. Uh, I think that deeper understanding is, is what's helped me see a path towards a very good future for both our industry and really for society as a whole on the basis of our industry succeeding in its goals. So I think um, I think it's really quite bright in terms of the future. I, I think it just needs to be more understood and obviously needs to get executed on. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to get back to doing that. But it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to speak with you. Uh, and thank you for having me on the podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. If you're a talented founder or developer, please consider reaching out to our team at fourthrevolution.capital. And for future episodes of the Edge podcast, please check out our link tree at edge underscore pod.